My name's Evan. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. I've been kept sober since September 25th of 98, and I'm extremely grateful for that. I just r ran in here at the 11th hour. Um, this should be interesting because I am in a world of a mess right now in my life with 23 years sober. And um, couldn't be a better time for me to be up here and get back to basics and share about how incredibly amazing and special and powerful this program is and that it has saved my ass more times than I can count. And I know it's going to save me again. Um, I, um, I'll try to hold it together here, but <clears throat> I, uh, what it was like, what happened, what it's like now, what it was like, it was, you know, I grew up in Dallas, went to an all girls school for 14 years. Um, and I, I remember being a little kid and always feeling out of place and not really fitting in and always kind of questioning everything. Um, I have an older sister, she's three years older, and um, she was, and still is, you know, kind of a rule follower. She just sort of accepted, you know, here's how, here's what you do, here's, here's how you show up, okay. And I was always the, well, why? you know, kind of person, like, um, I needed, needed to understand, you know, and, um, my mom shared with me really in this past year, I always thought my first drink that I was, uh, that I was 12, but I was actually apparently, um, what did she say? I was like three or four and she caught me, uh, at a pool party and I had snagged a beer and was drinking it behind like a rock, like behind a boulder waterfall kind of thing. And, and she came around the corner and I had my brown bottle and, and she gave me the look and this is my mom telling me this story, I don't remember. But, um, and that I just kind of looked up and was like, Tee? you know, and, um, but my first memory of, of my first drink was, was when I was 12 and, um, Again, you know, went to a one of those big parties with a girlfriend and her family, and um, she and I snagged two bottles of champagne from the open bar. You know, if you walk behind, there's big buckets of booze, and uh, we went and hid under the stairs, and I drank my whole bottle and probably about half of hers, and. And I do remember distinctly feeling like this was the, it was the first time in my life I felt comfortable in my skin. That I got out on the dance floor, was talking to people. I mean, I'm only 12, but, and I was having a good time. And that really stuck with me. I remember my 10th birthday party and sitting at the head of the table and everybody's singing and it's kind of like a surreal memory with all the heads right around me singing happy birthday and feeling completely alone. And that's something that had plagued me and did plague me well into my sobriety was loneliness. No matter, even if everyone in the room was there for me and it was all about me, I still felt empty and really alone in the world. Um, my parents uh, stayed married until my father died. Um, nine years, almost nine years ago. And uh, he was a doctor and um, a workaholic. And he was always gone in the morning, you know, before I would get up and usually came home pretty late at night. Um, so I, I didn't see a whole lot of him. There was be one Sunday a month that he would take us to ride our bikes around the lake and do daddy daughter stuff um, but he wasn't around a lot and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and she was always there um, but she also had an escape and her escape was sleeping so she was always there to pick us up from school you know do her duties um, feed us dinner but if she wasn't 
doing what she needed to do, she was asleep. So my sister and I kind of fended for ourselves and um, it was a really lonely house to grow up in, really quiet. You kind of pass each other in the hall and it was kind of like ghosts and it just, no one talked. And, um, and I just kind of had to figure it out. I had everything materialistically that I could ever want. Um, we were very well taken care of um, in that sense, but, um, but that loneliness really got hardwired into me. Um, moving forward, it, you know, I didn't drink again for a little bit, but I remember in seventh grade, I, you know, got blamed for a little rumor. Girls are mean, by the way, in seventh grade. <laughs> I was mean too, but um, I got blamed for this silly rumor and like everybody turned on me. And um, eventually it came out like four months later what really happened and who was really responsible and all that good stuff. And everyone kind of found out and was like, oh, whoops, sorry. But for four months in school, I was getting hate letters passed to me in school and I still have them actually in a box. Um, you know, a stack this high of just mean, mean, mean things. And yeah, I'm 13 years old. And I started, um, my dad had taught me how to make a gin and tonic for my mom and how to make a gin martini for him. And when I was about six. And so I would make their drinks and then go upstairs and do what I would do, you know, on the days that my dad was home, you know, weekends or whatever. But um, I started taking liquor and hiding it under my bed. And I drank alone a lot. And um, not necessarily every day, but um, until later. But um, 13 to 16, you know, I always had something under my bed. And um, started smoking cigarettes and I had a little balcony off my bedroom and I'd sit out there and you know drink whatever I was drinking and smoke my cigarettes and um, just live in the dream and um, <laughs> so you know my parents are good people they just um, they had their own problems and their own stuff and um, you know suffered from their own bouts of depression and and alcoholism and workaholism and sleepaholism and um you know it just that's just the way it was but i got by and um you know got through school and um when i was 16 i started dating a boy that uh you know the bad boy and he introduced me to um, other outside issues and um, dabbled in that pretty lightly through high school um, but it got to the point with that and with my drinking that um, I would you know we were I was allowed to leave campus as a junior and a senior to go to lunch or whatever and I would leave and um, my thing was to go to 7-eleven and get an orange slurpee and about that much of it and then fill it with vodka and take it back to class with me for the afternoon. And um, I did that uh, at least two to three days a week um, through junior and senior year in high school. And um, some of my friends knew, but I was always real secretive. And I was never the girl that, you know, was slurring and, and dancing on the bar or I love you or, you know, none of that kind of stuff. I always just sort of cratered in on myself and I was real quiet kept to myself and did my own thing and so most people didn't really know you know and that was kind of my higher power if you will that I had this secret and I was getting away with things and I was getting away with things in school and I would you know sweet talk my teachers into you know passing me through on the on the projects and the grades and things um and uh, on the outside, everything looked pretty, pretty sweet. You know, I had a pretty sweet deal. But um, I got into college, and um, 
I wanted to get as far away from Dallas as I could, and I went to a small school in Florida, and because Dallas was the problem. And so I went to this little school in Florida for two years, and then that little town in Florida became the problem. And all these people are crazy. They're into all this other stuff, and I'm, I'm getting into all this other stuff, and I'm like, I gotta get away from these people. They're, they're sick. Um, so I transferred to uh, University of Georgia. And the first school I went to had 1,700 people undergrad. Georgia obviously had you know 30 some odd thousand. I'm like, and I got there and I thought, well, this is great. I get to be anybody I want. Nobody knows me here. Um, and that was one of my things. Was I was this, I was a huge people pleaser and and I I would morph myself into what I thought you wanted me to be to be accepted and loved and belong. You know. Um, I'm the girl with the cool car that'll put your surfboards on top and let's go to the beach for the weekend. And I'm the, you know, I'm I'm doing all these things for all these other people. Um, and what I didn't know at the time, and I found out later, was that I was doing them for the wrong reasons. I wasn't doing them because I was some altruistic, amazing person that just wanted to make people happy. I was doing it because I wanted to fit in and I wanted to belong and I wanted to matter and I wanted all of those things, you know. I wanted to feel whole. And um, I went to Georgia and, uh, you know, morphed myself into this hippie girl that started dating the guy with the hair and the beard down to here and the musician and um, following a band around the country and, you know, doing all these things and completely acting like someone that I wasn't and um, and it was a real easy place to hide and it was a real easy place to get into my disease and all those things I said in high school or at the school in Florida oh I would never do that you know I would never in Georgia oh yes I would and you know they're the problem but I found out in Georgia, I was there about a year and a half and um, turned 21 there. And, um, you know, everything started falling apart. The teachers weren't letting me off the hook anymore. They weren't giving me extra time anymore. The guy was in love with somebody else. And um, my two best friends, a guy and a girl, we were like three musketeers for the year. They decide to couple, and I, all of a sudden I'm an odd man out. My boyfriend's in love with someone else. My cat disappeared. You know, my dog was killed at home back in Dallas. Um, everything's just like one thing after another. Bad, 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 and I'm not getting away with anything. And um, I went to this music festival. It's one of those crunchy um, bonfire drum circles bands, all the stuff, all the drugs, all the booze, in a field in the middle of nowhere, Georgia, all night festival, and I was completely alone, and I, I drank more that night than I've ever drank in my entire life. I took every single drug I could get my hands on that night, um, and blood-wise, I'm quite certain I was, you know, gone but mind wise I could not get messed up it just wasn't working I could not nothing I was taking was making me feel better um, and and I went home early um, as like my two best friends are sleeping together in the tent right next to me and I'm like oh, god get me out of here this is the worst and uh, the guy I'm into is in another tent over there with the girl and all the stuff and I was sitting in the drum circle and everyone's doing their thing around me and I just I felt so completely dead inside there was just nothing there's just nothing and um, I went home 
And I looked at myself in the mirror and I had that moment of clarity. You know, I was 21 years old. And for some reason, I called my mom. And I said, and I th it was June 2nd of 96. And I called her and I said, um, I, I, I'm in trouble, I don't feel well, I need help. And she said, I'm on my way. Didn't ask any questions. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how any of it happened, but that was at like seven, six or seven in the morning. And uh, she and my dad were on the first flight out and I picked them up at the airport. And as soon as they came off the plane, my father just crumbled. So I was, um, I'm almost 5'8", and I was 98 pounds. My pants are falling off. I can't, I mean, I was, I had, in six short months since I had seen them at Christmas, I had probably lost at least, well, at least 20 to 30 pounds um, from all the drugs and booze and, he couldn't handle it. I mean, it was just too much because he couldn't fix it, and he knew he couldn't fix it. But um, my mom, you know, they were there for a few hours, and I talked to him and stuff, and, and my mom sent my dad home. <laughs> he, was, he was a bigger mess than I was. And, uh, and he, he was just scared and sad and all of the things. And... Um, she stayed with me and got me through finals and took me to this wretched therapist, this woman. <laughs> oh, she was awful. And I, she was so nasty. And she treated me like a gutter junkie. And I'm like, I'm like wearing diamonds and pearls. I don't know what your problem is, but I don't have, I'm the one who wanted to get cleaned up. Like this was my choice. Don't treat me like some, you know, hoodlum that's hawking jewelry and, you know, lying to everybody and all that kind of stuff. And, and my mom was even appalled with her. She was really awful. But, um, I went to a different therapist the next day and she sent me to, uh, she wanted me to go to AA and I was like, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I just need to get cleaned up for a while. I need to get off of drugs. I'm not an alcoholic. I don't even like the way alcohol tastes. I don't even drink for fun. I drink, uh, I drink straight wild turkey and I drink a Diet Coke all night. I go and get double, triple shots of wild turkey and I drink a Diet Coke. I don't, I'm not, I don't even like the taste of alcohol. Um, I'm not an alcoholic. I might be a drug addict, but I'm not an alcoholic. And um, she's like, yeah, okay. And I convinced my mom that I was fine because this is what I wanted. I wanted to be sober. I, I can do this. And she left and I started summer school and a couple of weeks into summer school, I was like, all the reasons that I drink and use are still there, obviously. And um, I was like, you know what, I, I, I just, I'm not gonna do summer school, I'm gonna come home for the summer. And um, I got there and, and she put me in an outpatient treatment here in Dallas. And, um, and they introduced me to AA and sent me to my first AA meeting with the group. And it was funny, that first meeting it was at Preston Group and um, and I had been sober a couple of months, maybe two and a half months at that point. And um, it was the first time in my life that I was around people that understood and that I understood. And we all spoke the same language. And I don't remember what anybody said in that meeting. I remember where I was sitting, but I remember the feeling. And and I kind of dove into treatment and, and, you know, did all the things with treatment for six or eight weeks or however long. And, um, and it was good. Um, and shortly after I got out of treatment, 
I, I had a little fixer upper that I got involved with and he had been sober maybe a year or two. And, uh, and that was my thing. I'm sort of a serial mono monogamist, you know. I'm like, this is my identity now. I am so-and-so's girlfriend. That's who I am. So I belong here because I'm so-and-so's girlfriend. I'm supposed to be here. And that was my thing. And we, we stayed together a couple years, and I stayed sober a couple years, kind of in meetings and mostly hanging out in the half measures room, which was the office during meetings. That's what we called it. Um, and at some point that I'm not an alcoholic was always still in the back of my mind. And I'm young, I'm clean now, you know, 23 now. I finished school at SMU. Yeah, I went back. I never went back to Georgia. I was supposed to, but I had intended to. But I had built a strong group of friendships here and decided not to go back. Um, so I went into SMU and finished my education there. But I'm like, you know, I'm going to school. I've got a job. I've got a boyfriend. I'm going to meetings. I'm good. And um, But I don't think I'm an alcoholic. And I'm young, so... And the guy I had been dating, we weren't dating anymore, but we were still really good friends. And I called him up and I was like, I, I think I want to, I think I want to try to drink again. And he's like, well, let me come over. And he was sober. He'd been sober like four years at that point. So I guess he had two years when we started dating. But, um, and we talked and whatever, and I guess I convinced him that I was fine. And he took me to the Centennial on Greenville and Mockingbird that used to be there. And I went in, and he's like, do you want me to go with you? I'm like, no, 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 no I, let me just do this. And I go in by myself, and I bought one Rolling Rock beer. And I never even liked beer. And I bought one Rolling Rock beer, which is so odd. I get back in his car, and we drive to the Galleria. I drank the whole beer on the way to the Galleria, and I cried the whole time. And the reason I was crying was, as soon as I took that first couple of sips, it was like that whole time I had been sober, dry, whatever you want to call it, I, I never felt the presence of God. But when I drank that rolling rock, I felt him leave. And I, I didn't, and it wasn't him leaving, it was me. But at the time, it was like, it, he was there the whole time, my higher power, whatever you want to call it. And, and that was devastating. And we got to the Galleria, parked in the parking garage. I got out and I was furious. And I took my empty bottle and I smashed it against the wall in the parking lot and said, F it, let's go shopping. A little retail therapy never hurt anybody. So, um, and it was another two, three weeks before I drank again. And I'm like, see, I got it. I'm controlling it. I'm fine. As long as I stay away from drugs, nothing to worry about. Um, and I went to a, uh, like a little like high school reunion type thing at the Stonely P. And one night, a few weeks later, and I took my best friend from high school. And she never was really into drinking or anything. She was, she's normal if neurotypical, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, but uh, she wanted to go home and I was drinking, I was drinking wine and I'm like, oh, all right, I'll take you home. I took her home. And then instead of going home, I turned around and I went back by myself and most everyone was already gone, but I wasn't done yet. And I got pretty drunk and um, not, I have no idea how I got home, but, um, but I did somehow and started drinking again. And the next bout, I, I drank enough. It was early in the morning when I got started and um, was going about my business and I blacked out. And next thing I know, I'm on an airplane 
when I came to. And I'm like, where am I going? <laughs> I don't even know how I got there. And I, I didn't ever black out before because I think the drugs kept me from blacking out. So this was the first time in my life that I was really drinking, drinking without anything to keep me from blacking out. And so that was a new experience. But apparently I was on my way to Georgia. And my theory is I still knew people there. I knew where to get drugs there safely. Um, and when I got to Atlanta, my two of my other friends were there waiting for me. I set up a ride home. I was very responsible. Um, and I hung out with them for the weekend and it got weird and it got crazy. And when I came back to Dallas, I was done. That was it. There was, you know, I was like this, I'm an alcoholic. Like it just another moment of clarity of I can't drink safely. I can't control it. I can't do any of it. And I went back to AA and that was September 25th of 98. So I was out for about three months. Um, and it was, it was the first time I really, you know, got a hardcore sponsor, got worked the steps, got really honest. Of course, 30 days in, I got a new boyfriend because I still need my identity. Um, and he had like 15 years, a little 13th step action going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't the healthiest relationship. And um, my sponsor got pretty ticked off at me for staying with him. And I had just done my fifth step with her, which you know, it was like nine hours long, God bless her. And she hung up on me and I never saw her again. I still to this day don't know what happened to her. I mean, she had like 25 years of sobriety and I don't know what happened to her. But it doesn't matter because she was my higher power and it was a wake up call that other people, things, places uh, are going to fail you. I'm going to fail you, you know, we're human. And it was a huge wake up call to lose her. Um, but it was one of the best things that ever happened in my sobriety because it forced me to find a God of my understanding. And, um, and that became a really beautiful journey. And um, I, I got involved, you know, with someone else down the road, you know, boy meets girl on AA campus, second date, U-Haul, third date, <laughs> engaged. Well, it took four years to get engaged because he was terrified, but we got engaged and um, we got married and um, we had an agreement when we got married that we were get both gonna get, because we were kind of sponsoring each other for a little while, um, which, Please don't do that. Um, and he, uh, we agreed that we were gonna get new sponsors, work the steps, start our marriage off on a clean slate. I followed through, he did not. The healthier I got, the sicker he got. He went back out. I was the last to know, everyone else knew. Um, and he didn't wanna get help, and he didn't wanna get better, and he didn't wanna work on things, so. What else are you gonna do? So that was it. And um, we got divorced. And um, and we're still friends, actually. He just texted me like an hour ago. So we're still friends. But um, that was 17 years ago that we got divorced. And the next 10 years I spent really finding out who I was, you know. Went through several relationships, worked on my loneliness every time I worked the steps. Um, had my sponsor at the time was Christy and uh, and uh, she would always say to me Evan how many times are you gonna keep picking up the half-eaten hot dog in the stale bag of Doritos and I'm like I'm like but I'm hungry and she's like but you realize if you walk past the half-eaten hot dog in the stale bag of Doritos there's like a whole buffet you can have anything you want 
but it's behind a closed door, so you don't really know. And I'm like, but what if it's not back there? You know, and we had this conversation probably 40 times in the 10 years or so that she sponsored me. And, and uh, every time I would do the same thing again, insanity, expecting different results, she's like, half eaten hot dog. I'm like, I know, I like hot dogs. Um, you know, it was ridiculous. But in 2000 and, uh, what year was it, 2012? Yeah, I had 14 years of sobriety and I hit a really hard bottom that year. Uh, 2012 and 2013 and it was one of those times where I stopped dating, I stopped, you know, I was I'd taking a year off, I'm not gonna even look at anything. Um, working on myself, really working on my loneliness, figuring out who I was and what I wanted with my life. And my father and my grandmother were both dying. And um, so, and my grandfather had died a couple years prior and he was like my soulmate. And um, every day I would go to, you know, the nursing home, the hospital, work, home, meeting, home, you know, and it was me and my dog and my family. And those two years became about my family and I, at the time, had, um, had a toy store and um, I was going to Toy Fair in New York City, which I did every year in February and right before I was supposed to leave, my sister had like a freak accident. She lost 30% of her blood. She almost died. My father went back into the ER and my grandmother went into the ER all in the same week. And I'm like, mom, I, I can't go to New York. And she's like, you need to go, just go. Everyone's fine, everyone's stable, you need to go. And I went and I'm smoking cigarettes out the window of my hotel room, which, you know, they only open this much. and. It, there, there's a reason for that and I'm like I just felt empty again you know like what's the point I'm not happy I'm not fulfilled everyone I love is dying um, that year I went to nine funerals my one of my best friends had a heart attack uh, in a gas station parking lot in a U-Haul and died and fell over and they didn't find him for eight days in the parking lot. Um, my three cats all died that year. It's just like they're dropping like flies. Going to all these funerals. My dad died. Um, six months later my grandma died. Um, and it was like I was at a crossroads sitting there in New York and I thought, I want out. I don't know what that means, but I want out. I'm done. And I don't know what happened, but divine intervention, if you will, that I made a choice to dive into the 11th step into prayer and meditation and I started doing guided meditations every single day, going to meetings every single day, you know, resetting everything every single day, praying like I'd never prayed before. And this program 100% saved my life, um, again. And the loneliness all of a sudden too was gone. Like I had worked on it for 38 years and of my life had it with me. It was my best friend. It was comfortable. It was safe. I knew what to expect there and, and it was gone. And that was a little scary, like feeling serenity and peace and happiness and comfort for the first time can be really scary because you have something to lose all of a sudden and you're not in control anymore. 
You know, it's easy to stay pissed off and and expect people to let you down because you get to be in control there. And that didn't work anymore for me. And about a year after my dad died, I met my um, my current husband. And um, he was great. And um, until he wasn't. And we have a little girl. And that's why I was late. Because she wasn't safe. And I had to take her to my mom. And, um, you know, we had a rough marriage. I had a rough pregnancy. Took two years after I had her to figure out what was wrong with my body. And then I had seven major procedures on my abdomen once they figured out what was wrong with me. And I'm fine now. Um, my daughter has high functioning autism and she's a handful, but she's the most joyful spirit I've ever known. She's happy all the time and she's amazing and brilliant and different and the coolest kid in the world. And um, we lost our house in the tornado in 2019, which was four months after my surgery. And we were there and um, we got it back um, a year and a half later and we have our first mediation for the lawsuit in June because insurance decided they didn't need to pay for more than 30% of the damages. So financial stress, physical stress, surgery stress, tornado stress, moving, special needs child stress, work stress, 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 COVID stress, let's just throw that in too. Um, and, you know, about a year ago, a year ago, this month actually, end of this month, I, um, I found a program that for health and wellness. And I had struggled for about four or five years with my weight and all the things that, chronic fatigue, all these things, and not feeling good, having no confidence, just kind of being beaten down and um, by life. And, um, and what they, brought into my world worked and I felt better and all of a sudden I've lost 35 pounds and I feel better than I ever have in my entire life and I have all this energy and I've joined up with this community of people that are incredible and positive and uplifting and and supportive and just amazing people and got, you know, reconnected with friends here and I was living my life again and I felt better. And um, once again, the healthier I got, the sicker he's getting. And I just found out, I don't know, it's probably not something I should share from up here anyway, but it's not good, let's just leave it at that. And um, I'm really scared, but I know that I'm stronger than I've ever been. I know that I'm here tonight because I need to hear myself say this stuff 
that I have a community around me that will always show up for me in AA, in my health and wellness company that I now work for. Um, I have so much support and I've never felt closer to God and I feel like I'm in a place where I'm just kind of standing there like, no, not today, Satan. You're not going to take me down today. I know who I am. I know what I deserve. And I know that I have light and love in my life and how blessed I am. And nobody can take that away from me but me. Nobody can take the gift of this program and sobriety away from me but me. Nobody can make my God turn away but me. And it's my choice. You know, I can't control the thoughts that come into my head. I can't control other people. But I can control what I do with those thoughts that come in my head. And instead, you know, last week of falling back into my comfortable little hole where I know what to expect and feeling sorry for myself and eating and, you know, crying myself to sleep every day, I set an insane goal for myself with my work. And I got it. And it feels really good because I'm showing up for myself and I'm showing up for my life and even though there's this freaking shit storm going on around me it doesn't matter it can't touch me because I'm okay and I know beyond a shadow of the of a doubt that my side of the street is clean I know that I'm doing the very best I can with what I have today. I know that God is with me. I know that I have support. I know that I'm a good person. And when you have that from working this program, you know, to the best of your ability and being as honest as you can about the ugly parts of yourself, not you, me, being you know, I've been as honest as I can with myself about the ugly parts of me, and believe me, there's some ugly parts of me. Um, you know, what a gift we have to be here, and how many people I think about that give up and quit before the miracle, or they get scared, or, you know, let the voices in the old tapes take over and I guess my point right now is that A, I just lost my train of thought and B, that sometimes even it doesn't matter how long you've been around. It doesn't matter how long you've been sober. We have right now. We have today. We have a choice every single day to get up and do better and be better and show up for ourselves and our responsibilities. And today, I've chosen to do that. You know, and pretty close to positive that tomorrow. Mother's Day, I will choose to show up and be grateful for my daughter all day long and my mom and my sister and my friends and my life that is such a huge blessing. And I, oh, I remembered what my point was that no matter how bad it gets, you know, divorces, death, Tornadoes. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? Co 
COVID, whatever. Sorry, I have a potty mouth. I hope that's okay. Um, I don't have to pick up a drink. It will not make anything better. I don't have to pick up a drink today. And I'm so, so grateful for that. And I'm so, so grateful that at the very last minute, I had somewhere to take my daughter. And I know she's safe. And I have somewhere to go. And I don't have to be afraid. You know? I don't. There's nothing to be afraid of. You know? The only thing I'm afraid of is that, you know, I choose to turn my back. And today I don't have to do that. And so I'm kind of starting to repeat myself and ramble, so I'll stop. But um, I really appreciate y'all being here tonight. I really needed to be honest and vulnerable. And I really needed this. So I'm grateful for y'all to be here. So thanks. <laughs>